This is the home of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Of course, one of the features of, of this conference is that we have 10 prominent theater, theater people uh, who participating in this declaration signing ceremony. And uh, that's quite an impressive feat. I mean, these people know Shakespeare inside out and backwards. And uh, to get 10 of them willing to come forward and say, yes, they agree that there's reasonable doubt about who Shakespeare really was, uh, that's impressive. It would be much more difficult to do that with English professors. I think it's, it's just pretty clear that the authorship controversy is not such a kooky idea. And even within their own field, there's quite a bit of doubt. I will be signing the Declaration of Reasonable Doubt tomorrow and, and feel proud about doing that um, because it is a sort of a public statement. Uh, I came to this under, uh, to, to a belief, uh, if, or if you like, a disbelief in the, uh, the story about uh, Shakespeare at Stratford um, gradually over, an, uh, over a, quite a number of years. I've seen the entire canon at least twice, some four or five times, and it didn't make sense to me. Eventually, um, I said, you know, it's time for me to, to come out on why I'm no longer a believer in the, uh, in, in the Stratford story. And um, so that felt significant to do that. And I felt I needed to notify my board that I was moving in this, this direction because uh, it sort of has some significance that I, as the executive director of the largest Shakespeare-oriented uh, organization, or theater organization in the United States, would make a statement like this. As far as Oxford is concerned, I think he's a, uh, obviously a very attractive candidate. And what uh, I find particularly uh, interesting ab ab about him uh, are the parallels uh, between the, the, the stories of the plays and, the, and his own life and uh, the, the things that shaped him as a man, the, the early loss of his father, the involvement with, with, with the, the Cecil family, uh, w which uh, clearly shaped him, the, his access to books that were not uh, translated into English uh, at, at that time in the, in the 1590s. Uh, certainly this, fa the fact that he traveled as sub sub significantly as he did uh, gives a certain amount of credence to him as, as, a, uh, as a candidate. I'm the uh, 18th Baron Burley, and I'm a, a grandson of the original Lord Burley. I became interested in the question about uh, who wrote Shakespeare a few years ago largely because uh, my ancestor's daughter, Anne Cecil, uh, my aunt a long way back, um, was married to, uh, became married to uh, Edward de Vere. Uh, it became evident to me as, as I looked into it that there were a lot of uh, family connections involved in the, um, in the whole Shakespeare canon, actually, and especially Hamlet, clearly a, a biographical uh, statement. In fact, I wonder, actually, if, if uh, playwriters or writers in general can actually write anything that doesn't say something about them. Lord Burley uh, was very interested in collecting books of the day. In that number of books were all the um, references that were used in the plays, uh, Shakespeare plays. So Edward de Vere had that, having lived at Cecil House from the age of 12 until he was 21. A few years ago, a cousin of mine who was um, managing the house uh, at Burley House gave me a copy of um, Lord Burley's precepts, which were written, um, we think, about 1582, 84, 85, somewhere in there. The 10 main precepts in there are quite interesting in that they, uh, they kind of reflect what is in the play Hamlet. There is one in particular. Um, or a statement that's made following those precepts, which fits very well with the final 
statement by Polonius, um, to thine own self be true, which is, is so poetically and beautifully written in Hamlet um, and is rather ponderous and um, almost difficult to understand in Burley's uh, way of writing, which was very legal but um, not very poetically inspired. So I have, I have that book, which was published in 1637. I think the book itself was printed earlier in non-book form, 1616, I think, the, the year that Will Shakespeare died. Um, but before that, only family members or people, close associates, would have had a chance to uh, see those words, I would think. Certainly not Will. I uh, have been a member of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival off and on for 14 seasons. I uh, came here in 1989 for the first season. This is where I really learned um, how to play Shakespeare. As a practitioner, we invent it every time. We, you know, each, it, it is, there is artifice. I mean, the paradox is that we, you hopefully see authenticity in the human experience through the artifice of the theatrical form. Um, which I think is key to, as, at least as my feeling, about what uh, Edward de Vere, as the author of the plays, was wanting to get to, was the um, journey of artifice to authenticity. To publicly state it, you know, to avow that, you know, this is my firm belief, I think that's, that's, that's really important in this case, and I'm proud uh, to be a part of it. It's my pleasure to name the signatories uh, of this poster, which is the fourth formal signing ceremony of the Declaration of Reasonable Doubt. So uh, we are making a little bit of history here. James Newcomb, uh, of course, starred uh, in uh, Richard III, which we saw the, the, perhaps the most powerful history play in the 35 years that I've been living in Ashland. And uh, Paul Nicholson, the executive director of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. So I'd like to invite to the stage, <laughs> Jamie Newcomb, uh, to get the share with you. What's important about the declaration is the raising of the question. Because without a question, you can't have an answer. And you have to begin with the doubt. How is it possible? that one man could have learned all of the, the or everything that, he, that Shakespeare covers in, in his 37 plays. Like Jamie, I'm proud to stand here and uh, proud to have the opportunity to sign this declaration of reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm.